Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 24. Hear the word of the Lord. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. To make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for all those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. If you would, bow your heads and let's pray one more time. Father, as we prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear from your word, Lord, we, we ask that you would, by your spirit, take your word and, and use it to pierce our hearts. Lord, would you give us ears to hear what you have for us today? Father, we want to be uh, willing vessels, willing servants, uh, willing to receive anything you want to give us, Lord, however you want to use your word to minister to us, whether it's to convict us, encourage us, or all of the above, Father, would you have your way with us during this time? And Lord, as I seek to proclaim your word, I, I recognize my weakness, my frailty, my insufficiency. And, and so I ask, Lord, would, would you uh, give clarity? Would you um, give strength and energy, Lord? And would you bless the preaching of your word for the good of your people and for the glory of your name? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Paul wrote that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. We can therefore say that, that Paul had no doubts about his calling. He knew who he was in the Lord. He knew he was a servant, a minister of the Lord, called by Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. And though he didn't immediately know what his calling would entail, I do believe Paul soon became aware of what the Lord told Ananias when he was sent to restore Paul's sight. If you remember the story of Paul's conversion, he went blind, and so the Lord sent Ananias to go to him and restore his sight. And the Lord said the following words to Ananias. We see them in Acts chapter 9, verses 15, 16. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That important detail about Paul's future ministry, I don't think they kept that from him. I'm pretty sure Ananias communicated to him the words of the Lord. And we see in Galatians chapter 1 verse 16 that, that Paul, he, he, he told the Galatians that he was called by the Lord to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Exactly what the Lord told Ananias about his ministry. And so because of this, I, I do think it's fair to say that Paul knew from very early on that serving Christ and living for His glory meant that He would um, suffer much. He knew that, that serving the Lord and, and, and serving the church, because He was serving the Lord, was going to come at a very high personal cost to Himself. 
He was made aware of that early on in his ministry. And when we read the New Testament, we see that it became a reality. It, we don't have to go far. We see in several places in Scripture just how much Paul suffered, just how much he endured because of his love and service to Christ. One passage that really captures this well is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. I'm not going to read all of it for us, but, but in that passage, Paul lists out all the ways up until that moment in his ministry, all the ways in which he suffered, all the things that he endured. And I'm just going to share a few of them with you. He endured multiple beatings, lashes. He was imprisoned on multiple occasions. He suffered betrayal by those who were supposed to be brothers or sisters in the faith. He suffered hunger. He was involved in not one, not two, but three shipwrecks. And he was already stoned at least one time up until that point in his ministry. And there's more. That's not the whole list. You can go there and look at it. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28. And so Paul knew he was called by the Lord. He knew that he was called to, to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he knew what that meant for him. He knew that his calling of the Lord meant that he was going to endure much. And when we read about his life and ministry, we see that Paul went on. He was faithful. And he was willing to endure much for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of Christ's church. Why am I saying this? Why am I sharing this with you all? Because I believe in our passage today, in, in uh, Colossians 1, 24 through, through 2, verse 5, I believe we see different reasons for why Paul was willing to endure so much for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ and for the sake of his church. And the first reason we see is this, the first point, and, and it's simple but yet profound. Christ and his church are worth serving even if it comes at great personal cost. Christ and his church are worth serving even if it comes at great personal cost. Listen again to verses 24 and 25. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. We know, if you can remember, at the moment that Paul wrote this letter, where was he? Do you remember? He was in prison. Paul was very much suffering. He was enduring hardship, even when he wrote this letter. And, and what did that mean? Well, it means he lost his freedom. He lost his ability to go to churches that he helped plant. He was forced to depend on, on the gifts and food that people would bring him. He was forced to depend on others. He lost his comfort. In short, Paul was not living his best life now. He was enduring hardship. When he wrote this letter... And he was enduring it because he understood that that was part of his calling as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet at the same time, we see here, Paul makes very clear that his suffering was for the Colossians. It was for the church in Colossae. Now, if you've been following throughout the series in Colossians, this may be a little surprising because Paul had never even met the Colossians. He, he didn't plant that church. He had never visited them. In chapter 2, verse 1, we see that he hadn't even seen the Colossians or those in Laodicea face to face. So then how exactly was he suffering for them? Well, if you remember, when Paul was in Ephesus ministering and teaching, that's when he most likely met Epaphras and led Epaphras to Christ. And from what we can gather, Epaphras was the one who planted the Colossian church. He was the one who shared the gospel in that region. And so Paul's ministry, what he endured, what he suffered, it was actually bearing fruit amongst the Colossians. And so if we can say it this way, he was like a spiritual grandfather to the Colossians. It's in that way that he, his suffering was for them. That, that I think is easier for us to understand. What makes this passage so difficult is when Paul writes the following. What does he mean when he says, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? That's 
a hard verse. That's, that's a hard verse. Um, there are several interpretations by men and scholars who I respect, and, and I feel like I barely make it up to their heels. And we don't have time to look at all the interpretations. Uh, we really don't. But what must be said today is what this verse does not mean. So let me start there. I'm going to tell you what this doesn't mean. We, by no means, should interpret this to mean that what Jesus did to save sinners, His life, His death on the cross, and His resurrection, was in some way lacking, was in some way insufficient. No. Not at all. That is not a possible interpretation of this text. Places like Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 10, Romans 5, 17 through 19, and other places in Scripture communicate the exact opposite. What Christ did was enough. It was sufficient. And we only have hope and salvation in and through Him. So His, his life, His death, His resurrection is lacking in nothing. 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 And if you think about it, that would even contradict what Paul has shown us so far in the book of Colossians. What have we seen in chapter 1, verses 15 to 20? That it's in and through Jesus and His death on the cross that all things will be reconciled. What does that mean? It means He's supreme over all. If He's supreme over all, if all things will be reconciled and made right in and through Him, well then how can His death and what He has done be lacking? Easy, it's because it's not. It's not lacking. So, so there's nothing about Jesus and there's nothing about what He has done that is insufficient. Okay. Well, then what does it mean? It doesn't mean that. What does it mean? So right now, this is the position that, that I'm taking. I believe this refers to the ongoing suffering that saints will endure for the sake of the church. This is referring to the ongoing suffering that saints endure for the sake of the church. And so let me explain. What was lacking in the affliction of Jesus was his physical ability to continue to suffer for his bride, the church. Why was that lacking? Why is that lacking? Well, think about it. Where is Jesus? He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He is sitting in glory at the right hand of the Father. He, he is there on the throne. He, ever since His ascension, has no longer been physically present. And because of that, He could not physically endure afflictions for His church. Okay. Well, how is it that Paul can fill up what was lacking in those afflictions? How can he uh, suffer those afflictions if Christ physically can't do it? Well, this is where passages like Acts 9 verse 4 are very helpful to us. We've seen this passage a few times. It's a very important passage as we understand our union with Christ. If you remember, when, when the Lord, He, he, he uh, surprised Paul on the Damascus road, did He say to him, Paul, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting my church? No, that's not what He said. What did He say to Paul? Paul, why do you persecute me? Again, Jesus speaking from, from, from heaven. Paul, why do you persecute me? So what we're seeing there is that Jesus identifies so closely with his church that in ways we may never completely understand, if a member of his church here on earth is suffering, it's as if he's suffering with him. If a member of the church is being persecuted, it's as if Jesus is being persecuted with him. Therefore, if a minister of the gospel, if one who has been called by the Lord to proclaim the gospel and serve the church is being persecuted and suffering afflictions, we can say it's as if Jesus is there suffering those afflictions with him. This is why Paul could say that he was filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. It was because he was speaking about his spiritual union with Christ. He knew how closely Christ identifies with the church and therefore he understood when he was afflicted, when he suffered, when he endured hardship, it was as if the Lord Christ was always there with him, suffering with them, going through that affliction 
with him. Now again, this is my, my current stance on the passage. I'm teaching this from a place of humility. It could be that I keep studying this and, and, and down the road I may have a slightly different view, um, but that's where I am now. And, and, and here's the thing. When we consider that, when someone goes around and teaches or preaches that if you really have faith, if you truly are a child of God, well then you shouldn't suffer. You should live like a king or you should be living like a daughter of the king. There's just no room for that theology in Scripture. There's no place for that. We see very clearly that Paul, as a minister of the gospel, suffered. He went through affliction. And, and, and even if we don't consider this passage, I think this passage speaks to that, but even if we take this passage away, what did Paul tell, or what did Jesus tell his disciples? If you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. What is the cross? It's an instrument of torture. It's an instrument that brings death. Therefore, to follow Christ, to serve Him faithfully, we need to understand what comes with the territory to some degree or another is going to be some type of affliction or, or some type of persecution. And that's going to look differently where we are in the world. But, but that theology, that teaching that you should never get sick or never go through hardship or, or suffer want, that's just not biblical. That's just not what we see in Scripture. Now again, if at some point my posture here changes, I will let you know. I will come back and clarify. But here's the thing. Even if my position on this verse changes, it still doesn't change what I think Paul is saying here. It really doesn't change the heart of, of what's going on. I believe Paul was telling the Colossians that he was suffering for them. He was communicating this to them. Because he wanted them to understand that suffering for Christ and suffering for his church was worth it. He was glad to suffer for them. What did he say? He's able to rejoice in his suffering for them. It was worth it. It's worth it to endure hardship for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. And notice, he wasn't only willing to suffer or endure hardship. He was willing to work hard. He was willing to work like a like a like a, a beast or an animal, however you want to say it. We see this in verse 29 and, and, and in verse 1 of chapter 2. Look how Paul describes his service, his ministry. For this I toil, struggling. And, and in verse 1 of chapter 2, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea. The, the original word for struggle here is actually the root of our word agony. Have you ever been so tired, you've worked so hard, so long, that you get home and you just hit the bed and you're out for 12 hours? Have you known that exhaustion? I'm sure all of us, at one point or another, we have felt that. I remember after helping a brother move and driving 17 hours, I got to my dad's house, I laid on the couch, and I slept for 13 hours. That's that, that real righteous exhaustion. That's what Paul's communicating here. That's the type of struggle. That's the type of hard work that he's getting at. It's the type that, that would cause, you know, pain in his bones. He's just tired. He's, he's exhausted. And so, on the one hand, we see that he was willing to, to endure hardship. He was willing to suffer because of his service to Christ and the church. And on the other hand, he worked hard. He, he worked through blood, sweat, and tears, if we can say it that way. He, he worked to the point of exhaustion. He struggled because of his service to Christ and the church. And so the picture that I believe Paul is painting here is that Christ and the church are worth serving. They are, they are worth working hard for, even if it comes at a high personal cost to us even if it costs us much, even if it leaves us exhausted. That's a good reason to feel exhausted. And when we think about what our service ultimately is for, this is one of those Sunday school questions, right? Why do we exist? Why did the Lord call us? Why did He make us? For to what end is our service and obedience to the Lord? All of it at the end of the day is for His glory. 
everything we do, every way in which we serve, it should be because we are trying to bring glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our lives, our service, our obedience. All of it. it it's to point to Jesus. It's to bring glory to Him. And so when we serve the Lord, when we are willing to serve Him, and, and if needed, serve Him through suffering, if we are willing to work this hard and toil in this way for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of His church, that brings glory to His name. And if it brings Him glory, then guess what? It's worth it. It's worth it. It is time and energy well spent. So here's... Here's a question. This is a question I was asking myself, and I was even talking it through some with, with Sarah. If being willing to work hard is, is, is obviously a biblical concept. Being willing to work hard for, for the gospel and for the church, it, it's biblical. And being willing to endure hardship and suffering, we see that this is a biblical thing. This is a good thing to be willing to do. If that's the case, then why are we Christians so often unwilling even to just be inconvenienced for Christ or the church. We, we see this in Scripture, and yet when, when the rubber hits the road in our daily life, even though we know this intellectually, the way we act, the way we live, to be inconvenienced, we, well, we just don't want to be. I don't want to be inconvenienced. If I'm going to do it, I want to do it on my terms, on my time, according to my schedule. I know it's important eternal kingdom work, but, you know, I had these plans. Why is that? And, and here's the thing, and, and I, I promise you, I, I, I apply this to myself, and I'm working through this, and, and it, it ministers to me. It's not that we aren't willing to suffer and work hard. It's not that we are unwilling to be inconvenienced for, for certain things. We are. And we do it all the time. If we're running late for work, we will do what we have to do to make it on time to work. We know the importance that it is to get to work on time. And yet how often when we're running late for church, it's, eh, it'll be fine. We just don't give it the same amount of importance as we do other things. Or we don't make it as much as a priority as we do other things. Or sometimes we're willing to work extra hours or maybe spend less money because we want to save for the vacation or we want to save for, for something that we want. Are we willing to take a day off to come to the church and clean? Are we willing to, to take time off so that we can serve or visit someone who, who can't come to the church, a brother or sister who's homebound? And so here's the thing. This is going to look different for each of us. We know our hearts. We know the things that we may be prioritizing more than we should. But if we want to be willing in this way like Paul, if we want to be a, a believer that's willing to work hard and suffer and endure for the sake of Christ and His kingdom, we need to accept something about ourselves. We need to acknowledge something. We don't always value most what the Lord values most. Because again, many times we are willing to work hard. We are willing to suffer even if that's necessary. But we're only willing to do it for the things that we want. We're only willing to do it for the, for the goals or dreams that we've established for ourselves. It's not a lack of willingness. It's towards what we're willing to apply that energy. And so if we find ourselves feeling like this, if we recognize that we're living like this, then church, what we need to do is recognize it for what it is. It's wrong. It's sinful. We need to repent. We need to repent and ask the Lord to help us stop prioritizing things over and above His Word and, 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 and what He has called us to do. We want to ask the Lord to empower us to, to prioritize the mission He's given us even more than our own personal dreams or desires because if we have been called by Christ, then why do we live? Why do we exist? For His glory. To carry out the mission that He has given us. And here's the other side of this coin that, that I know we may struggle with at times. Sometimes when we think about serving the church, and what I mean is our brothers and sisters in the church, sometimes when we think about serving people in the church, we, we, we hesitate. We sometimes just don't want to. And why is that? 
Well, it's because for one reason or another, we've become disillusioned. Sometimes we see things in people's attitudes or actions or mindsets and, and we're disillusioned and, and, and that just kind of seeps into our heart. And so the next time we consider serving the church or working hard for the sake of the church or, or doing something for someone, we pump the brakes. Eh, why should I? I mean, look, look at what they've done or how they've lived or, or how they treated me at that one time. We, we hesitate. And so again, when we recognize that we are thinking this way or feeling this way, we need to call on the Lord and ask Him to help us see the church the way He sees the church. How does Christ see the church? Well, let me tell you. Even though we, the church, are a bunch of imperfect sinners, because that's what we are, in case you haven't noticed. We're a bunch of imperfect sinners, yet how does the Lord view His bride, the church? Ephesians 5, He loves her. And how much does He love her? He loves her so much that He laid down His life for her. Christ died for His bride, the church. He died so His bride can have life. And if He views the church in that way, if He loves the church with that type of passion, then as followers of Christ, we need to ask Him to help us view the church and love the church with that same passion, in that same way. If he values and esteems the church so much that he was willing to die for it, do you know what that means? That means that the church has a value that we will never be able to comprehend. Because the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, laid down his life for her. There's no way we can even quantify that. And so when we're hesitant to serve the church... To, to endure hardship, to, to endure suffering for the people of God. Let us ask the Lord to, to recalibrate our minds and to view the church how He views the church. To help us prioritize what He prioritizes. To help us value what He values. To, to live our lives as those who are worthy of the calling. Those who recognize that we no longer live for ourselves. But we live for the King who has saved us. And here's the thing, we need to do this, brothers and sisters, we need to do this from a place of humility. We need to do this recognizing that we can't do this in our own strength. We need to, when we see in our hearts that we're prioritizing the wrong things, that we're valuing things more than we should, we need to repent, we need to call on the Lord to forgive us, and then we need to ask Him to give us the energy to actually serve Him in this way. We need to be willing to do it, but then we need to ask Him to empower us to do it. We can't do this in our own strength. It is only by His grace. Even the Apostle Paul understood that he couldn't serve the Lord so sacrificially in his own strength. Verse 29, what did he say? For this I toil, struggling with what? With all His energy that He powerfully works within me. Paul understood that he was able to endure so much and he was able to, to serve in such a way even though it came at such a high cost to him because the Lord was giving him the grace and the strength to do it. The same needs to be true of us. Let's call on the Lord and ask Him to forgive us if we know we've been prioritizing the wrong things. Let's ask Him to forgive us and let's humble ourselves before Him and, and, and ask Him to empower us, to give us His energy so that we can work hard for the sake of His glory. So that we can work hard for the sake of His bride. Because in doing so, it will bring Him glory. And if it brings Him glory, and if it brings more people to the feet of Christ, then that means it's worth every second of it. It's worth it. If there's anything we can do so that the gospel can continue to be proclaimed in brothers and sisters, let us pray that we would be a people willing to do it. And that leads us to our second point today. Paul was willing to endure so much for Christ and the gospel because he wanted to present believers mature in Christ. Paul wanted to present believers mature in Christ. The purpose of Paul being made a minister by the Lord was so that he can make the Word of God fully known. In other words, so that he can proclaim the Gospel. He was to make the Word of God fully known. We see that in the second half of verse 25, but then in verse 26, 
he goes on to describe the message, the word that he is to make known. And how does he describe it? As the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now is revealed to his saints. I think most of us, when we think about mystery, we tend to think about something that is unknown and, and it always kind of stays that way. It's mysterious. We'll never fully comprehend it or get it like UFOs or something like that, you know? Will we ever know? I don't know. But mystery doesn't have to mean that. Mystery can also be referring to something that once was a mystery, but guess what? Now it's been revealed. Now we understand it. It doesn't have to be something that stays that way. We, we see a biblical example of this in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, where the Lord was revealing mysteries to King Nebuchadnezzar. It was unknown, and the Lord made it known. That's what Paul's saying here. The message he proclaimed, a mystery for generations and ages, was now being revealed to the saints, particularly to the Christians who, who were Jews. And so what is that mystery? What was it that Paul was communicating that was a mystery now being revealed? We see it in the last part of verse 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That seems almost a little anticlimactic, doesn't it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That sounds great, but I think we wouldn't mind some more information. Well, what do you mean by that? The Christ in you, the hope of glory, and who exactly? This is why we started our service with Ephesians 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul speaks about the same thing. And it gives more clarity to what this mystery was. Because he spoke to the Ephesians about this mystery as well. I'll go back to Ephesians 3 for us. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Which has not made known to the which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit this mystery is that the gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel when we consider ephesians 3 we get a clearer picture of what Paul was talking about. His message, the gospel he was proclaiming, was that Gentiles, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, could now be incorporated into the people of God under the new covenant that was in Christ. It didn't matter what their ethnicity was anymore. It didn't matter if they weren't a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't have anything to do with them anymore. What it was about now was who was in them. And what does Paul say here? Was Christ in you. That's what matters. If your faith is in the gospel, if your faith is in Jesus, then you receive the Holy Spirit. By faith you are united with Christ, which means the Spirit of Christ is now in you. And when the Spirit of Christ dwells in us, what does that give us? It gives us a hope of glory. That's the good news. That's the mystery that he was proclaiming and he was making clear. That was the message that, that he sought to transmit. Now that message of salvation, it, it, it's that. It's a message of salvation. But, but let's be clear, Paul's ultimate goal wasn't just to make converts. It wasn't just to, to see people be saved. Paul sought to make disciples. He sought to teach and to admonish and to train. We're working through the book of Acts on, on Wednesdays and on Fridays. And, and soon, I don't know when, we'll get to this part of Acts. But what we see in Acts, that when Paul went and planted a church, many times he stood there, days, months, sometimes years at a time, doing what? Doing what he says here, admonishing, teaching, preparing, equipping. He was making disciples. He warned everyone. He taught everyone in hopes that on the final day, everyone under his preaching and teaching influence would be presented mature in Christ. And even in that language, notice how universal the scope of the gospel is. Look how he wrote it. Teach, warning everyone. Teaching everyone so that on the final day everyone who believes everyone whose faith in Christ can be presented mature Paul believed that he believed that no matter who you are 
where you're from, no matter your background, no matter what you did 20 minutes ago or 20 years ago, if you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus, you can be saved. You can be counted part of the people of God. That was the mystery that he was making known. And he believed it so much that he toiled. He struggled in order to equip and teach those saints. He knew no matter the ethnicity, no matter the educational background, every person in Christ was able to grow in grace and in knowledge of who Jesus was. He worked hard for that. He toiled for that. Blood, sweat, and tears, exhaustion. That's the type of work he did for that so that believers could grow. And if he couldn't teach them himself, he was equipping men so they can go and teach these disciples. And so this, this should encourage us. This should encourage us to strive to grow. I'm sure some of us, maybe all of us at one point or another, in reading the Bible, you got to a place with the Bible where you're just like, I don't know what this means. I, and what do we do sometimes? We close the Bible. I don't get it. And we give up and, and, and we just kind of wash our hands and we walk away. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Strive. Fight. Toil for your maturity. Toil for your growth. Paul made this a priority. He worked hard so that the believers under his care would be presented mature. He wanted to know that when Christ returns, they would be found mature. He made that a priority. And so the question that we all need to ask ourselves, do we make our spiritual growth is our spiritual health a priority? It was for Paul. Not just his own, but, but these other believers in the church. Do we toil? Do we struggle for our own growth? And again, if we know we don't, well, let's just own up to it. Let's repent and then let's ask the Lord to change our hearts. Let's ask the Lord to work in us the will to do and to act so that we can honor Him. But what we can't miss here is that if believers are being presented mature in Christ, what that implies is growth, movement. No one stays static in the Lord. Movement can be slow. Sometimes we're in seasons of life where we feel like our growth in the Lord is like an army crawl. We're just getting by. That's okay. But growth, movement, it must be the goal. That must be our desire. We must call on the Lord to help us make a priority of that, just as Paul did for the Colossians and for others. Now, my prayer is that as a church, we would call on the Lord to work this in us. We should call on the Lord to help us become more passionate about evangelism, about His Word, about service, about missions, about gathering. He can work this in us, but, but we need to desire it. We need to want it. We need to call on Him to give us the desire. We need to recognize that in our strength, we can't do it. But are we calling on the Lord to work that in us? Now lastly, to wrap up today, one final thing that we see here is that Paul understood that the gospel was sufficient. That the gospel was sufficient for salvation and for maturation, for growth. Paul understood that the gospel was sufficient for salvation and for maturation. Notice how, how he speaks of Christ in the gospel in chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Paul believed that the Colossians could be encouraged, that they could grow in unity, and that they could reach all the riches of assurance and understanding of God's mystery. How? How? How did he believe they could do that? By seeking Christ. By knowing Christ. What Paul's doing here is he's actually beginning to mount his argument against the false teachers. In chapter 2, we're going to see him begin to go on the offensive. He's going to begin to demonstrate why what they're teaching is, is wrong and not biblical. And, and many scholars believe, and, and I'm of this opinion, that what they were teaching was essentially a kind of Gnosticism. 
What's Gnosticism? Gnosticism was basically this uh, philosophy or teaching that there's a secret wisdom. There's a secret knowledge. And if you obey these specific things, if you keep these festivals, if you worship these divine beings, you can attain that secret wisdom. You can attain that secret knowledge. And it's not available to everyone. It's only for those who are willing to do these things. And so what's Paul doing here? He is, he is I mean, he's striking at the heart of, of their argument. He's cutting at the heart of that teaching because he's reminding the Colossians that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are where? In Christ. They're in Christ. You want to grow in wisdom? You want to grow in knowledge? Don't start looking for some earthly philosophies and traditions. You find that in the Word of Christ, in Scripture. In Him, all these things are found. And, and why was it important for them to remember that? What are the repercussions? Look what he said in verse 4. In order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. In other words, Christ is not only sufficient to save you, but He is also, Him and His Word, it's enough for you to grow. It's all you need to grow. Give yourself over to Christ. Give yourself to the study of His Word, and you will get all you need. Christ and His Word, it's, it's like an ocean the size of a universe. No matter how long you swim in it, you will never explore it all. We will never fully understand or enjoy the riches that are found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will never fully comprehend the glories of the Gospel. And so, when we give ourselves to His Word, that's that's sufficient. His Word in Christ is enough for us. And I'm not saying we can't read good books that aren't the Bible. We can read good books. I'm reading good books with the deacons. I'm handing out books left and right. But those books need to be solid books that are founded on Scripture. And if those books begin to contradict Scripture, you don't believe the book. You believe Scripture. Because Christ and His Word is sufficient. All wisdom and understanding is found in Him. And notice Paul, he, he was encouraged by the faithfulness of the Colossians. He says so in verse 5. Yet even though he was encouraged by their faithfulness, the threat of false teaching, it's so serious to him that he still wants them, he encourages them to fix their eyes on Christ. He reminds them that Christ is enough, that they need to seek Jesus and Jesus alone. He warns them against being persuaded with these false teachings that may sound interesting, but at the end of the day, all they do is take away from what Jesus has done. That's what it boils down to. If someone comes to us and says, you are saved by faith in Christ and this thing over here, you have to do this. Do you know what they're saying? That what Jesus did is not enough to save you. That what He did on the cross, what He suffered on the cross in your place and in my place, wasn't sufficient. That's what it boils down to. This is why false teachings that take our eyes off the gospel in Jesus can be so dangerous. Because we begin to put our hope in something else. And our hope is built on nothing less than what? in Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's in Him and in Him alone. And, and this church, they were seemingly doing well. And we saw that Paul, he was encouraging them towards unity. Why? I mean, they're doing fine. Why are you reminding them to be unified? Again, because false teachings are dangerous. One of the things that false teachings can do in a church is what? It can split a church. If false teaching makes its way into a congregation, it can split that congregation. It causes harm. And so just out of warning, out of precaution, even though he was encouraged by them, he's reminding them to be unified. He's, he's encouraging them towards loving one another. He's reminding them how he's heard of their love and, and, and that they, didn't, they need to be united in heart. And so sticking to Christ, sticking to the gospel. That is how we can guard ourselves from falling into to false teachings. This is how we can protect the body that is Grace Baptist Church from potential dissension and division by as a church clinging to the truth of the cross. 
clinging to what we see in the Word of God, holding on to, to sound doctrine. And brothers and sisters, we need each other in this. We need one another. This is a corporate effort. I need you to love me and if necessary, keep me in check. And you need me and the rest of the church at times to go up to you and say, listen, it's going to be okay. Christ is with you. He is sufficient. He is still Lord. This is another reason why I think Paul was encouraging them towards unity. Because when, as a church, we stand together against false teachings, we stand stronger. When as a church we are holding on to the gospel, then we, we as a church can be more faithful because we're not in it alone. We're in it with the body of Christ, with our brothers and sisters in the faith. So if you're here today, or if you're hearing this online at some point, and you... You don't know Christ. Your faith, your hope is not in Christ. Hear me say today, Christ is sufficient to save you. What He has done on the cross is enough to cleanse you of your sin, to give you new life, and not just save you, but keep you, preserve you. And so what that means is, you don't need to believe in Christ plus Start changing the way you dress or, or start worrying about righting some wrongs or, or, you know, doing... No! Humble yourself. Recognize you need a savor. Repent of your sins and then trust in Jesus. Believe that He lived, that He died for your sins and that He rose from the grave and that He did it for you. And if you believe that, you can be saved. You can be part of His people. You can join in this wonderful mystery that all who place their faith and trust in Christ can find rest and salvation in Him. Amen? Amen. If you would, bow your heads and pray with me. Father, we, we once more just thank You for, for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for how You use it. And, and again, we just ask now that you would use your word however you see fit to encourage us, to convict us, and to spur us on towards faithfulness. To spur us on towards love for our brothers and sisters in the church and even around the world, Lord, that would you help us be, be willing to be a people who, who will expend themselves for the sake of the gospel. In our own strength, we will never do it. And so we call on you, Lord, to empower us and to give us your energy so that we can be faithful servants to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.